Boom, Stan Efferding is in the studio. One of the strongest humans to ever walk the earth at one point was known as the strongest bodybuilder in the IFBB. This dude is a beast. He's also super smart. The guy's helped so many people in nutrition, professional athletes, of course, professional bodybuilders, top MMA fighters. He's a wealth of knowledge. Stan Efferding, the white rhino. By the way, he's like in his 50s, and the guy can still lift about three times as much as Justin and about 15 times as much as Adam. It's insane how strong this guy is. It's crazy. Anyway, we know you're going to love this episode. Also, by the way, we have a channel called Mind Pump Clips. If you just want short, smart fitness tips and fun stuff, go to Mind Pump Clips, sign up, subscribe, and turn on those notifications. All right, here we go. Stan, welcome back to the show, man. Always great to have you on. We love what you do. I want to start out by talking about um, just something real basic, like the best, let's start with some of the best foods somebody could eat for muscle, uh, maintain a lean, healthy physique for longevity. Generally speaking, what are some of those foods? Boy, it sounds basic, but we can't, it's going to take me a minute to get there Okay, mm -hmm. because you kind of got to meet the client where they're at, right? So I said, what's the best diet? The one you'll follow. Mm. And I kind of have to start there uh, because there is no best food. There's dietary patterns that I think are, are more important. Uh, there's calories, obviously, if your client's got metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, high lipids. Uh, then you're considering weight loss, first and foremost, out of the gate as a triage, right? Got a, got a guy that comes into the emergency room and he's got a bullet wound, you're not down there clipping his toenails, okay? Mm. And I, I just just got lambasted from my Tom Bilyeu conversation about uh, uh, the McDonald's diet. Mm. And uh, Merrick posted it, reposted it, and it had over 3 million views and thousands of comments, and people were just ripping it apart because I said that, uh, you know, 95% of health benefits are realized simply from weight loss itself, irrespective of diet, and that the weight loss is really the primary goal. So if you're asking me for general health, for somebody with some presenting with some sort of metabolic syndrome, as mentioned, then weight loss is the first goal. Now there's, you know, obviously we have to be in a calorie deficit to, to achieve a weight loss. And there's a, a number of ways to do that through calorie restriction, increased workload, or a combination of the two. And we see that calorie restriction is probably the preferable choice because more exercise doesn't equal more weight loss because the compensation problem where people go out and crush themselves on workouts and then they start sitting more and eating more. But generally speaking, we'll start with, you know, as far as dietary patterns go, it's cholesterol or, or it's, uh, it's calories. Yeah. Let me, let me pause you for a second. Cause I, I want to back you up because yeah. the data is very clear on this. When you look at diets across the board, if the calories are low enough, and of course, and, and, you know, correct me if you, or, or if you think, uh, uh, you know, you disagree, but of course there's, there's, nutrient um, uh, essentials that need to be met, right? There's yeah. essential nutrients. But aside from that- That's a different conversation. That's right. a second conversation. Right. right. So, yeah. but if calories are low, what you see is you see health benefits. This is why you see studies on keto diet, carnivore diet, vegan diet, Mediterranean. I mean, any diet, if it gets someone to lose weight, you do see health benefits. Now there's more to it. And I think we're kind of oversimplifying, right? Because you know, it can influence how you feel and behaviors and stuff. Yeah. But what you're saying is 100% true. And I know that pisses people off, yeah. But there's been professors and people who've actually shown this and said, hey, I'll eat you know, fast food and I'll show you that I can improve uh, all my markers. Yeah, well, and that's absolutely true. And that's what I talked about with respect to the McDonald's diet. We have the Twinkies diet and there's a whole host of 7-Eleven diet and the potato mm -hmm. diet. And as long as they can achieve a calorie deficit. Actually, when you do the research, we look at the research, it suggests that the most effective diet for the, for the shortest term reversal uh, uh, or regression of type two diabetes is an 800 calorie liquid diet. <laughs> you know, none of us, would, and, and this is what I said five years ago in my obesity rant, uh, when I did the rhinos rant on YouTube about the fattest population in the world, I was referencing the, uh, you know, my family in Samoa, uh, hmm. my wife's family. And I said that, that the calorie deficit was the critical factor. Uh, but I said, I would never recommend a McDonald's diet. That's the part that gets cut off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. You know, doesn't make the full internet clip. Right. right. <laughs> so everybody watches it's that 60 convenient. second clip and then that part gets cut off right. uh, for a host of reasons. But the fact still remains that the deficit itself would, you know, results in uh, the reversal of uh, just about everything. And mm -hmm. people say, well, what about their cholesterol? Well, 
We see this even with keto diets, high saturated fat keto diets. If there's weight loss, they'll see an initial reduction in LDL. Now, long term, you don't want high saturated fat in your diet. And that's where, you know, those considerations can be made. But at least initially, if you want to lower your blood pressure and you want to lower your cholesterol and you want to, uh, you know, improve your, your blood sugars, uh, weight loss for those people who have those issues, metabolic syndrome, which is north of 70% of the mm -hmm. population, has some degree of, of uh, overweight or obesity that's resulted in <clears throat> insulin resistance. Right. So again, for the vast majority of folks, uh, I'm looking at calories are king, I wanna lose weight, um, uh, and then I start to make other considerations. Those other considerations are uh, adherence, would be second. Very important, right? Because uh, one of the biggest challenges with just cutting calories, so someone might listen to a clip of, of you talking about, oh, the data says I just got to cut my calories. But if it's a diet that makes you feel like crap or you don't like it, it's not going to work for you. And you said right. that earlier, the diet that you'll follow is the best diet. 100%. Yeah. I said that 800 calorie liquid diets within seven to 10 days is going to see a significant reduction in your type two diabetes risk. And so you'll have improved your health. Can you maintain it? What are your energy levels like? What's your satiety like? That becomes the problem. And then mm -hmm. you're talking about things like potentially lean muscle mass loss, which would require you to start talking about macros and exercise. Now you've got to have sufficient protein in the diet and probably some sort of resistance training. Uh, and I don't know why it always has to be kind of a dichotomous choice an either or mm. diet or exercise. It's, it, it's always both. And that's, you know, why we try and comprehensively put together a package of, of lifestyle changes for folks that would result in the most optimal change. Uh, certainly a little bit of weight loss, some more exercise, mm. some resistance training, uh, optimizing the micronutrient value of the foods, uh, you know, long term, that's going to give them a better you know, weight loss maintenance result. So after we talk about calories, and then maybe we jump in there and talk about, you know, certainly compliance is right up there. And then we're talking about protein. Are you getting sufficient protein so you're not losing lean muscle mass? And uh, uh, obviously, we're, you know, we, if we want to shoot for a, a macro amount, then we're going to, you know, we're talking about probably a gram per pound of lean weight or goal weight, you know, mm -hmm. 0.8 per current weight. And that's going to vary depending on the amount of uh, obesity that an individual has. Uh, we don't want to match, you know, 0.8 to somebody who's a 40 BMI. Um, so use a lean body mass, subtract a body Or fat. he said, or goal, goal weight. Or goal. Yeah, I mean, somewhere you got, you got somebody who's weight. 300 pounds. They normally want to be down to 200 or 250. Yeah, so, so 200 eat. grams of, of protein. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I hate being so vague. You kind of got to be if you want to be accurate because it, it doesn't apply the same to everybody across the board. Right. But I, at the same time, I want listeners who are uh, – trying to lose weight to have a, a pretty easy to navigate hierarchy of most to least important things to concern themselves with. And uh, so we said that, you know, try and get into a calorie deficit. So you do your little BMR calculator on the internet and plug in your weight and your workload and it gives you a number and that's an estimate to start at. And the next thing you want to shoot for after you have that kind of daily calorie number is to try and fix your protein first. Uh, and I'll mm. fix that at, let's just say a gram per pound of goal weight. It's mm -hmm. a pretty reasonable number. I'd, I'd assume that would be pretty near your lean weight is what you would, your goal would be. Right. Um, and that, you know, there's a whole host of things. Obviously it lends itself better to preserving lean muscle tissue. Although the weightlifting stimulus, as we're seeing from Stu Phillips uh, research that he's referenced recently is probably as or more important than the amount of protein. Cause he's had some pretty limited proteins, say maybe, 0.5 grams protein per pound of lean mass still be able to retain their lean mass if they were training hard enough. Mm. I'd rather eat a little more and train at a sufficient level that's sustainable mm -hmm. because as mentioned earlier, you start crushing people on workouts. Not only is it such a huge departure from their regular daily uh, you know, schedule or habits that it's not very likely to become you know, a long-term lifestyle. Not only that, but then you're also, I mean, uh, uh, theoretically you're hoping that if and when the time comes when you do overeat a little bit, that some of those extra calories get partitioned to building muscle, right? And they go to work. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that would be the goal long term is to have sufficient muscle so that you, you're insulin sensitive and you can and not, and you, know, you include some carbohydrates in your diet to, yeah. and not feel crappy or, or be subject to that. You know, so. let me, let's back up for just a second. Um, See, we're this talking is about slow going, isn't it? No, this is great. <laughs> you wanted some foods. We no, 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 there. that's yeah. not true. I mean, we, you're actually uh, answering it. I mean, I love, tell, I love telling the audience because we're so yeah. transparent in our show that, you know, when we first started this conversation, like we we're always, in, in, you know, guided by like the people who run our channels that like, hey, these topics, this is what get people to click on it. And so, of course, 
it's going to start off with that, but then if you really know your shit, it's going to be nuanced. Yeah. Every and answer we'll, and we'll should get be there. nuanced. And, and hold your question for one more second. <laughs> yes. We'll get there because okay. my clients demand of me, Stan, just tell me what to eat. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Here on this show, amongst this broad audience, I, I want to make sure we get there. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think you should eat, but I, I want you to understand that that's not uh, the only way to do it. And sure. here's the, the, the criteria or the priorities that you should consider right. when you get to that. There's an diet. order operation there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So go, go ahead. Yeah, oh, so... Um, do, do you notice patterns of, of diets that people tend to have the hardest time sticking to? Like, I do. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. what do those patterns tend to look like? Yeah. And I should say, uh, you know, a lot of folks talk about dieting. I've been a professional dieter all my life. You know, I've gained and lost well over a thousand pounds throughout my career, <laughs> bulking up to 300 bills to, to power lift and dieting down to single digit body fat to, to, uh, to compete in bodybuilding. Uh, and I've trained people all my life. I was a trainer in, in college to, to, you know, to get by and uh, studied exercise science, worked in gyms, you know, was a coach. Um, I own a gym now. I've owned multiple gyms over the years. I train people now. Mm -hmm. And we just started a 90-day uh, fit challenge that over 200 people entered and they're all – you know, dad bods and soccer moms, gen pop people, these aren't athletes. I know I always get uh, the accolades from training the famous athletes and, mm -hmm. and people associate me with that. But the fact of the matter is the vast majority of people I train are, are weight loss people. Here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Powerlift. This is the powerlifting-based MAPS program. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 uh, hours that we drop this episode. So as soon as we drop this episode, within those first 24 hours, leave a comment. Also, subscribe to this channel. Also, Turn on notifications. If you do all those things and we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you want free access to Maps Powerlift. If we like your comments, we got to like it though. Also, we got a sale going on this month. Maps Symmetry and Maps Strong, both 50% off, only happening this month. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below to get signed up. All right, here comes the show. Patterns that you notice, because okay. it's so important to, to be able to stick to and hear to yep. something. Do you notice patterns and diets where you're like, okay... <clears throat> Yes, the calorie deficit's going to be there, but uh, the, these types of patterns lead, tend to lead to people falling off. Mm. Yeah. Uh, too big a change is right out of the gate, as I mm -hmm. mentioned with training. When you try and completely change somebody's diet and you throw them into that guru, bodybuilder, bikini girl diet with uh, egg whites and tilapia and chicken breast yeah. and, and broccoli and a scoop of peanut butter, which becomes a shovel full of peanut butter by <laughs> the end of the diet. That, you know, is, is a pretty, pretty good recipe for failure. Mm -hmm. And so I, I usually ask my clients, I send them a detailed questionnaire and, you know, ask them what they like to eat. I give them some, you know, some scores as to, and a whole list of foods as to what do you prefer? What do you not enjoy? Uh, I wouldn't want to include, you know, dietary items in, the, in diet recommendations that were things that they absolutely despised or, uh, you know, couldn't stomach. And so I asked them what they want to eat first. And then I, I try and, you know, again, as, as part of this slow transfer from where they're at to where they want to be, it's not zero to a hundred, zero to one, one to two, mm -hmm. you know, if they're sitting on the couch all day watching TV, if you just get up and take a walk or two, if they're drinking, um, you know, sugar sweetened beverages, if you can just get them to a diet soda, that's a significant change. Sure. And you can see some weight loss. Probably the, the, as mentioned, we talked about calories in general. The next thing I'm really looking at beyond compliance as kind of a, a, a global metric is uh, protein. And, and what I find is, particularly with women, they vastly underconsume protein, yeah. particularly for breakfast, which now we're seeing all the research. Uh, with blood you know. sugar and insulin and all that right. stuff. Yeah. Remember everything was intermittent fasting, skipping breakfast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it's early time restricted feeding all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think it was some five years ago when I did that Iceland seminar. I said, eat like a king for breakfast, a prince for lunch and a pauper for dinner. Mm. Uh, was it Jack Lane that said that first? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. Yes. Uh, that, that's another thing that's important is that uh, we see these trends come and go and, and, you know, none of this is new. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, even with the vertical diet, uh, you know, I've said a lot of this stuff was around in the 60s with Arnold and uh, Vince Garanda, yeah. you know, was talking about, uh, you know, the kind of protein sources and, and that that they should be eating. So... You know, I never claim to invent uh, things. I just, from my personal experience and that of my clients and then from the literature that, that I think is, is, is most widely accepted, understanding there's a, a study to support, you know, just about any, uh, you know, any opinion in this industry. But that doesn't mean they're all equivalent in terms of, of whether or not, uh, you know, the, the vast majority of the industry or the, I think, the academics that, uh, that we got a consensus on these things. So, uh, 
I chase protein and I chase a big protein breakfast right out of the gate would be the best. And now we're seeing that's important for chrononutrition. We're seeing that's important for uh, uh, blood sugar control and appetite control in subsequent meals throughout the day, not just the breakfast um, for um, lean mass retention and, 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 uh, and uh, you know, stopping the catabolism from the extended, you know, overnight absence of eating. Uh, so, you know, breakfast seems to be the big meal. And so I'll tell most of the ladies that I talk to in particular, uh, guys tend to eat more and, 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 you know, they tend to trend towards higher protein foods generally. So it's not as big an issue. Uh, but if you tell them that you want them to get 30 plus and maybe 40 grams of protein for breakfast, they're a long ways off because generally yeah. they're eating like one egg grams. and a bagel, <laughs> yeah. right. you know? And so I'm like, yeah, you're right. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, that's six grams. Yeah. <laughs> Where do we get the other 25 to 35 from? So I, I have to show them uh, a host of different options and, and ways to make that happen. I need this many ounces of a, of a, of a meat source, whether it's chicken or fish or eggs or uh, even yogurt. Uh, and once they see the size of that, and I guess initially the turn off, uh, the, the impression would be that that's a lot of food, mm -hmm. but the calorie density of a lean protein is, is very minimal as compared to, you know, even one of those muffins at Starbucks might be seven or 800 calories, yeah. uh, but 40 grams of protein is 160 calories. And so if I can get them to that 40 grams with a lean source, maybe a, a fat-free Greek yogurt, <clears throat> maybe a, a, a 96, four beef or a top sirloin mm -hmm. steak or some chicken breast or, or, um, uh, blending an egg, egg white combo, but just so they understand the quantity yeah. of that. So I think we're finally st starting to slowly get to the original question that was asked is what kind of foods do I recommend? Yeah. Uh, and it would be, you know, low calorie density, high protein. I usually kind of shoot for a two to one protein to fat ratio, generally speaking, if they want to quickly look at a label or, uh, you know, check a, uh, a menu on a, uh, at a restaurant. Uh, that's, that's kind of where I start at. Um, and then I guess secondarily, I'm looking at satiety, which protein lends itself well to that. Because um, the number one people fail on diets is hunger. I mean, that's, that's really it. Oh, yeah. and, we, and we see that in spades now with the new um, uh, diet medication that's, that's largely promoted, uh, the semaglutide. That's sure, it. Yeah. Um, you I know, mean, because mainly that's what it does. Is that's it, all it does. Yeah. yeah. It's not a fat burner. <clears throat> no. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just, just makes you eat less. It makes you eat less, period. And so if we can, if we can use the tools available to us uh, without the need of medication and not suggesting some of the glutide isn't a, a viable option for those people who need it, uh, but at $1,000 a month, there's certainly a barrier to entry oh, there. Wow. Um, <clears throat> I would suggest that we would use every tool available for satiety. And then I have this satiety list. And, and when in my 90 day challenge, that was one of the first things I sent out. Mm. I said, here's a list of tools you have in your toolbox. They're going to help you to become satiated. And here's some things that might uh, actually add to your, uh, your hunger. And we want to try and curb those things. And so I kind of go down the list of, of things for satiation and eating that high protein breakfast, getting a, a, a significant uh, sleep is kind of even before the breakfast. Uh, people who sleep less tend to have higher ghrelin hormone release and are just hungrier during the day. Plus, I also think just being up 18 plus hours a day gives you more opportunity to get hungry and have a, another meal, <laughs> yeah. especially as it gets into the evening. Um, so the longer you sleep, the less hours you're awake, the more, you know, the more likely it is you'll be able to satiate yourself with that three meals that you're, most people probably trend towards. Um, and then those are high protein meals. And now we've got satiety protein, obviously the high thermic effect of food, the satiety benefit, um, fiber is it, you know, throw in plenty of fiber, you eat more oats. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, vegetables, fruits. There's a couple of foods that are on this high satiety index, uh, which is, a an index that, that has measured how people respond to certain foods and how long they stay hungry. Um, <clears throat> And that's uh, like potatoes, boiled potatoes and oranges. They're like the highest of the index. If I throw boiled potatoes in with a high lean protein source and maybe a, a salad and uh, a couple pieces of fruit, people tend to be satiated longer. Mm. We see this in, in research on, say, <clears throat> um, women with PCOS. Uh, they just tend to be ha have leptin resistance. They, they have more visceral fat. And that central adiposity results in an uh, interruption in, in uh, leptin and hunger signals. So they're, they're hungry more often. 
And uh, we used to think that they had a lower basal metabolic rate or metabolism was slower, but in fact- They just eat more. They, they do just eat more. And, and it's not, and you hate blaming the victim. It's not a matter, this isn't a discipline issue. This isn't a willpower issue. That's not, not a good strategy. They've got all successful. the hunger drivers. 100%. Yeah. I couldn't, I, you know, I've dieted for bodybuilding shows as we've all dieted. Uh, you get down to single digit body fat and that's all you think about is food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can remember times going to bed at night and just dreaming. I could see my pizza being made. Oh, that's so funny. I'll have, I, I'd I, have I, dreams. Like that. I, didn't, I didn't dream about food until I competed. Yeah. That was never a thing for oh me. My, my entire yeah. life, I never dreamt about food until yeah. I competed and then became a regular dream. Yeah, and your wife's just pissed because she'll she'll be next to you butt naked and, and you're like, nah, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, That just becomes not even a consideration. Yeah. Some of that might be the lowered testosterone from the... Yeah. <laughs> you know, from the, the calorie restriction, et cetera. But uh, I mean, I used to work in a pizza place when I was a teenager and I could, I could actually visually see the pizza going through the conveyor and the, the pepperoni curling and browning on the edges and, <laughs> and, the, and the, the cheese bubbling, you know, and, I, and that, those are the dreams I'd have. And I remember one time I put all my friends in the car and I drove up to Seattle and got a, a brick oven pizza up there and watched them all eat it. No. <laughs> yeah, wow. just so I could you know, have that. Yeah, and I didn't have any because I was on a diet. You know, I had my little yeah. chicken breast Absolutely. or whatever. Take a bite and then breathe on me. <laughs> yeah. 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 And they were just, describe they it. were just astounded that I, they were like, sure you don't want one? I'm like, yeah, I do. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the point is, is that, that um, we have to be empathetic, sympathetic to the fact that this isn't a willpower issue. These aren't undisciplined people. They just have, they just have hunger cues that, that a lot of us, uh, who claim to be more disciplined simply don't have, uh, probably because we tend to eat more protein, tend to eat more whole yeah. foods. Um, you know, I, I think that's. And by the way, out. what you're saying, I think is is. Um, uh, I, I think it's very good to to talk about because then people can go to the next step, which is okay. I have these strong hunger drivers. Well, what can I do that'll lower the, versus it's just willpower? And now I don't change it. How do I, I get to that. where the, mm -hmm. the, the impetus, where the desire lessens, right? Yes, yes, yes. How it's, it's just, it's manageable hunger. It's not hanger. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we'd like to do is get them there. And as I mentioned, if you've got visceral adiposity and you've, you've got poor sleep and sleep apnea, I mean, you, you've got to go all in on that first. If you've got, you know, insufficient lean body yeah. mass. You've got to go all in on those things first. You've got to get a CPAP, get your sleep fixed. You've got to uh, obviously lose as much visceral fat as you can, as quickly as you can to get yourself in a position where you even have a fighting chance. And then use these tools, the higher protein. Go, go a little foods. deeper on that, Stan, because that's uh, something that it took me a long time to actually connect these dots. And, I'll, and I, re I vividly remember uh, what house, when it happened, and like finally making this connection. And that was some of the most challenging times that I ever uh, was, had with fighting off cravings was when I was in a diet and when I had poor sleep, yeah. like just a rough night that yep. night. And then the next day, I mean, I could have been so, I was consistent on the diet, dial, workouts, everything's perfect. We, not even really thinking that bad about other foods. I'm, I'm happy with, my, I'm content with my healthy choices. Then all of a sudden I had a rough night. And then the next day, yeah. all and, I'm thinking about is right. bad food. And that's what we talked about with the hormone sing signaling. Your body releases ghrelin and that's, and you just become voraciously hungry. It's even worse than that. You guys have heard me say before, if you're waking up at 4 a.m. to do fasted cardio after five hours of sleep, you're stepping over $100 bills to pick up nickels because- Wow, Ooh, good, good, point. Point. good analogy. Very good point. Waking up after a short sleep and then training uh, <laughs> is counterproductive because you lose more muscle than fat. Your body becomes stingy uh, with the fat uh, and will burn the muscle preferentially as a, it's part of its defense mechanism. This is Dr. Matthew Walker's research that uh, he's spoken about many times. And so I'm really cautious. I would much rather you get the sleep. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's why I don't assign, and this is kind of an aside, I don't assign cardio to my clients, including competitive clients. I don't assign like a 40-minute cardio session. Not terribly effective, not terribly enjoyable, certainly not sustainable. You don't see anybody, you know, too many barriers to entry. I got to get changed. I got to get in my car. I got to go to the gym. I got to put 40 minutes on this treadmill. With a career and families and other obligations, that's the first thing that, that yep. goes by yep. the wayside. Agreed. Yep. Can I get that <clears throat> stimulus in, in far more effectively and more sustainably from somewhere else? And hence, there you know, is the 10-minute walks, which everybody's heard me talk about ad nauseum. But it replaces that 40 minutes of cardio 
The timing of it post-meal lends itself better to um, insulin control, the postprandial glycemia elevations, uh, uh, digestion. It's more convenient. Uh, it's something that you can do in, in a busy day, whether it's walking the kids to school or, you know, at night before bed, just taking a brisk 10-minute walk. Uh, if you set, again, setting yourself up for failure, if the, if the proposal is that you're going to do a 30 or 40 minute cardio session a day, where does that fit in and how sustainable is You're that? also attaching it to a behavior and habit that you already sure. have, which all the research is very clear on the success rate of that, which I think yeah. is the magical part yeah. of the, the 10 minute You know, it took me training. a long, so training clients, do you know how long it took me to figure that out? To figure out that like, no, instead of doing 30 minutes or 40 minutes of cardio, why don't you just walk 10 minutes after? Now, how long did it take you to figure that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming in your 20s, maybe 30s, you were like, oh yeah, I get on the treadmill twice a day, 30 minutes. How long did it take you to piece that together? Well, remember I was powerlifting. So the concept back then was don't run if you can walk, don't stand if you can sit, and don't stay awake if you can sleep. <laughs> just shut it down. You know, and then just that. pound as many calories as you can, and it didn't matter what kind of calories there were. Both of those things were dead wrong. Obviously, don't recommend any of that. I, I think we all today. at one point live by that. Yeah, yeah the, the, the dirty bulking. And not just the, the excess calories leading to excess body fat, but the amount of saturated fat I would consume with you know ice cream and fatty meats and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, and with bodybuilding, I found that the excessive cardio, uh, for me had a bit of an interference effect, you know, form follows function, my body on a treadmill, my legs would start to shrink. Um, and, uh, I would, uh, I would lose muscle mass going into a bodybuilding show. Uh, and again, it just wasn't terribly sustainable. So in 2009, when I was, uh, uh trained with Flex Wheeler, uh, he didn't have, let me do any cardio, zero. One year prior, I did a ton of cardio and I did chicken breast and egg whites. Uh, and that's when I had the pizza dreams. Mm. And I weighed in at 223 and won the Emerald Cup up in Seattle in 2008. I trained with Flex Wheeler. And this was about six months of, of the whole, six or seven months of the whole process. The last three I spent with him in here in San Jose. Matter of fact, I stayed at the same hotel last night. It's kind of nostalgic. Oh, wow. oh, yeah. Right across from the 24 hour fitness that I trained at every day for oh, three right. months. Uh, and lived there at that, uh, I forget what it was called at the time, its name has changed, but it had a, a full kitchen and two bedrooms and me and, um, and Keith Williams trained with, with Flex. And one of the things I remember from that time is when you know, you're dieting for a show and uh, he would have a stop in at Carl's Jr. because he wasn't dieting and <laughs> get him a, a breakfast and uh, he would get those crisp cut fries. Oh God, and those are so good. Those things smell amazing. And he's sitting there in the car eating these on our way to the gym and Keith and I are just like, white knuckling like this, you know, but we were eating a lot. I mean, he was eating almost four pounds of top sirloin steak a day, wow. you know, about, uh, about six meals a day, 10 ounces a meal <clears throat> cooked on a Foreman grill. You know how tough that, that stuff is? It's like <laughs> eating leather. <laughs> and uh, two years of my life was on the Foreman uh, grill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so where did I, where did I go off? Where did I lose track here? I knew <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to. Well, just, just when, how, when you piece together the, yeah. it's just the walks instead of doing. So he had me do no cardio and I, I weighed in, this is one year later, I was two. 23 on the Emerald Cup stage, and I won the, the overall the Emerald Cup. One year later at Masters Nationals, I weighed in at 252. Whoa. In really similar condition. 30 more pounds and just damn near as a lean. lean body mass. Oh. Yeah, but it wasn't a story of how much muscle I gained. It was it's a story, story about how much to. fat or how much muscle I didn't lose. Right. Yeah, and that's the key, by the way. So anybody listening right now who has no, they just don't care about being a bodybuilder or being that big or whatever. The lesson here is uh, you can get lean and lose less muscle. And, and, and you don't want to lose muscle. That's your fat burning machinery. 100%. I was 270 before both of those preps. Wow. So the other one you lost, all, you went all the way down to 223 and this one just down. To Very common. I can't remember the name of the gentleman. It was a long time ago uh, who was, uh, I mean, he would bulk up to 300 plus like Lee Priest used to do that. And then Lee down to do that. 236. Mm -hmm. And it just wouldn't look very good. It was just, you know, you'd lose a lot of muscle in the process. So you're right. You, you, you don't want to gain too much fat in your gain phases and you don't want to lose muscle in your loss phases. So you just have to be a little more patient, a little more gradual about it. So mm. to keep this story going, I learned that in the absence of cardio, I was still able to get really lean and the workouts. I mean, we were working out twice a day with high volume and short rest periods, they were plenty sufficient for me to have a significant you know, cardiovascular health from that. I mean, it was extraordinary the amount of volume flex put us through with 20 rep sets, so two minute rests, oh, yeah. squatting down between <laughs> sets. I mean, it, the, it was challenging. We were in deep water a lot. So then I went to train with Mark Bell, uh, 
and we started squatting heavy. Uh, you know, initially, of course, from dieting down, I wasn't that strong. But within just a matter of a few weeks, especially from eating and getting my, my weight back up, uh, you know, I was able to start getting stronger. I and mean, we were squatting some weeks over 800 pounds pretty consistently Holy week God. after week. Uh, and I wasn't recovering because I stopped the movement. Mm. I was just resting. I was applying my 90s mentality. And I would just go home and just sit and lay there. And I would have doms for three or four days. And so I got a recumbent bike and I put it in my hotel room. Uh, it was up in Sacramento uh, with where I was training with Mark. And I started immediately Sunday after we would train that evening, I would ride the recumbent bike for 10 minutes. And why the recumbent bike over walking was just because it was a greater range of motion, less impact on my knees. Uh, it was real low impact, all concentric. Yeah. And I could do a little hit session. I could, I could bike against modest tension for 50 seconds reasonably fast and then rest for 10 or 15 and do 10 of those. And I started doing them three times a day. I wake up the next morning and do that, next afternoon and do that, next evening and do that. And I found that my doms would go away within easily 48 hours. Yeah. As opposed to Accelerates it, recovery. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, and my appetite was better, mm -hmm. which was important, meaning in, in that instance, which is kind of a dual uh, uh, benefit to the 10-minute the walks or bikes, is that it helped me digest my food faster. But it also, we see that people who get there are six to 10,000 steps a day have a better satiety effect for weight for people who are doing weight loss as opposed to overtraining and having that compensatory, right. you know, get hungry and sit more effect. It's kind of a, that's just that walking somewhere around. I don't know what the measurement is. Five, 6,000 yeah. steps kind of lends itself well as one of the tools in the toolbox for satiety is to, is to take those walks. So yeah. I think that there's so much value that the average person can learn from bodybuilding that they don't pay attention to because they look at a bodybuilder and they see an extreme body, right? They look at yeah. the highest level of, of building muscle and getting shredded and they say, okay, I don't want to look anything like that or that's just unachievable for me. And so I'm not going to listen to anything, but what bodybuilders have done have mastered the art of maintaining muscle and keeping a fast metabolism. They bodybuilders, which is ironic because that's what the pursuit of every, that's exactly what you want. want. Like when your client comes to you yeah. and they say, I want to be in better shape and you could say, Hey, would you like a faster metabolism? Look better, feel better. Yeah. <laughs> and of course they would all say yes. And yeah. the, that's the, <laughs> and I chuckle a little because that, that gets people to thinking, well, I don't want to look like that. And yeah. it's like, well, yeah, good luck. <laughs> you won't, don't worry. You won't. <laughs> if you don't wake up one morning, you'd be like, <laughs> Oh my God, I'm Ronnie Coleman. <laughs> what happened? Yeah. You know, I squatted Trust too me. hard yesterday. <laughs> uh, it, it is. I've tried and it doesn't happen <laughs> my first bodybuilding show in 1986 i was 158 pounds you know soaking wet in the novice lightweight class uh it took me a long long time and it's years and years and years of force feeding and crushing workouts <laughs> i mean the idea that that somehow you're going to wake up one morning and be like oh i went too far yeah it, it just it just doesn't happen yeah. so yeah but the lessons are great because um for the average person what they can learn from bodybuilding pursuits is how to do less work, get leaner and have a faster metabolism, which, you know, if you, if you think of the context of modern life, you know, if you go 10,000 years ago, you don't want a fast metabolism, right? You want a slow metabolism so you can be efficient. Right. But now if you want to maintain your health, what'll buffer it, uh, or one of the best buffers you can have is to have muscle and, and be able to burn it off just sitting there. I, I, what you just said has started to crest now amongst yes. all of the longevity people well there's a couple of holdouts dr walter longo and david sinclair <laughs> neither of which could fight themselves out of a wet paper bag or 120 <laughs> pounds of wispy noodle uh, and they're the only ones still saying you know restrict protein because mtor and yeah. Uh, cause mice, um, but everyone else, you know, even Dr. Peter Atia, who was, you know, was fully invested in ultra, uh, endurance athletics, mm -hmm. uh, and the keto intermittent fast, multiple day fast, uh, call it an obsession at this point, which she's that kind of guy, you know, genius, brilliant guy. And I talked briefly before we came on and I said, look, I've been doing this for well over 30 years. I don't expect. I don't, you know, claim to be any smarter than any of these people, but I've been there before, you know, I've seen it. Uh, I've done it. Uh, I've had hundreds, if not thousands of clients now that we've witnessed. I'm just patient. You know, <laughs> mm. I, I just see these things come around over and over again. And somebody's pissing on keto sticks for three years straight and showing you the results. I, I just wait, <laughs> patiently wait. And sure enough, they all come around eventually. You know, I went on 
Paul Saladino's podcast and, and told him about the, the great benefits of carbohydrates and how, yes, I eat fruit and even white rice because I want to crush fantastic workouts and have pumps and, and build muscle and be strong. Mm -hmm. And he was fully keto uh, carnivore uh, intermittent fast at the time. And now look, he's eating carbs, particularly around workouts. Yeah, fruit. Mike Mutzel's yeah. podcast. I love Mike. Brilliant guy. Smarter than me. But I sat there on his podcast some years ago when yeah. he was keto and, and intermittent fast. And I said, look, you can get to the top of the Empire State Building using the stairs. I'm taking the elevator. Yeah. And if you want to get the most out of your workouts, that anaerobic lifting, you're going to want to consume some carbs. So now Mike consumes carbs around workouts. They all do now. Mm -hmm. The only holdout is, is uh, 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 who is it? Uh, Sinclair? No. Uh, why is his name? Carnivore Doc. Um, oh, I know. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. I can't remember his name. The, 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 oh, oh, Doc. Oh, I feel, we had him on here. I feel terrible. We've, no, I know. We've, we've had him on here. Yeah. 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 I was oh, come on, Doug. Podcast. Why, is, why am I losing it? Big, now? big guy, too. What's, why he can't likes I, the row. I cannot think of his name yeah. right now. Is he held up still completely? Mm -hmm. He's only been sta still steak, still, still ribeyes yeah. every day. Still, you know, you know yeah. I'll tell you what, though. I think Sean Baker. Sean Baker. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Love Shame Sean. on all what of us. What a freak. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I, you know, I tell you, I think there, there definitely are, and I, I do want to say this, I think there definitely are outliers in the sense that, you know, a carnivore diet is the ultimate elimination diet. Sure. And if you have, you know, autoimmune reactions to foods mm -hmm. and you can't identify what the hell is going on and you eat foods and you get reactions, you get inflammation and you feel terrible, like going down to the most fundamental food, which would be meat, right? It's one of the most nutrient dense foods. You're going to feel a lot better. So I, I think there are definitely individuals that fall in that category, yeah. but it's way less yeah. than what they would have you believe. Well, not only that, I would always make the case too that, you know, there's something in there that they obviously eliminated that makes them feel so much better. But was it every single car? Right, was it, right. And and if and would you do better with you know some blueberries and As raspberries compared to what? Did you just get off the standard American diet? Yeah, yeah. that's true. Right. Almost any of those interventions, yes. you, you know, hopefully get you away from the standard American diet. No, yeah. no question. But as I mentioned, I, I, I think it might be over restrictive for most people long term in terms of compliance. And you could certainly there's might pretty, be. It's for sure. It's for sure. <laughs> and, and there's compelling evidence now that, that the you know, that gut microbiome is is uh, is pretty important for a lot of things, uh, you know, for immune system and uh, for cholesterol control, particularly, you know, LDL. Mm -hmm. um, it gets clearance. very limited when you cut your diet, your diet that way. It's, it really it, does. So yeah. even beyond the performance benefits of the carbs, there's also, you know, and that's why I've always had fruits and vegetables in the diet, but I've addressed those people with IBS and who need an elimination diet to kind of start with the FODMAP mm -hmm. diet, which is much more diverse, over a hundred food items in there that, uh, that then, and, and, you know, <clears throat> that to me was more inclusive than what was going on, uh, you know, as far back as when I've been training women for shows since the late eighties, early nineties, uh, doing that that old guru diet with the egg whites and protein powder yeah. and broccoli. Uh, the FODMAP diet is far more inclusive. Uh, and also, you know, keeping red meat in, keeping the egg yolk in, keeping dairy in, keeping uh, fruit in, you know, all the things that provide all those other nutrition benefits. So now we're talking about more foods, which was the original question, what kind of foods would I recommend? Yeah. And we got through calories and protein. Yeah, 40 minutes later. That's yeah. <laughs> and, and then kind of just got off on all of this compliance and satiety. And those are those are probably more important than the foods themselves, which is why we started. I 100% yeah. agree. If I come right out of the gate, like, don't eat this and don't eat that. Yeah. Um, I've since avoided saying, don't eat this, don't eat that. Uh, you get crucified by the academics in the industry um, for fear that that doesn't apply to everyone. You know, and I've always said that even with the elimination diets, it's individualistic, it's dose dependent, how the foods are prepared matters, it's cumulative in nature. I mean, yes. there's a whole host of things that you can you can go through uh, to set up those criteria. And I, I think, I think Alan Oregon does probably the best job of this with his flexible diet, which is, which is kind of an improved, uh, if it fits your macros, which was bastardized into um, yeah. pop tarts and protein powder, you know. Uh, by just talking about the fact that that if we would eat more whole foods and less ultra processed foods, and not necessarily because the ultra processed foods are poison, but because all the research suggests that you'll eat more calories totally. as a result. Just mm -hmm. all the stuff we've been talking about in terms of satiety, and even in that post that I did on Merrick's site, 
<clears throat> that was run on Merrick's site, most of the people who responded were like, oh, that stuff's poison. You're going to get cancer and you've got chemicals. And, but, you know, you ask for a reference. What kind of chemicals are you speaking of specifically? You know, it's bread, meat, you know, <laughs> pickles, mm -hmm. tomatoes. Uh, and nobody can really name a specific chemical or a dose um, with respect to these even processed foods. It's just the lack of satiety and the overconsumption of those foods that results in the behaviors, the adiposity. It's the behaviors that they come the with that comes with it. This is That's why, this is why, uh, in my opinion, I'd love your, I'd love your input on this. This is why we've have old data, which you can counter very strongly, but you have old data that shows that high sodium cause, you know, heart disease and cancers or with an high associated fat. increase in blood pressure. Okay. Right. High sodium with an associated increase in blood. Right. Pressure. But I'm going to go further. Right. Then yep. there was a, uh, was high fat. Oh, it was high fat. That's causing. Yep. And then it was, Oh no, it's the carbs and the sugars. High fat with high saturated fat for those individuals who don't have adequate clearance but, can yes. increase LDL and, and be unhealthy. And I'll take it a step further. Right. Look at the three main ingredients that make foods hyper palatable, salt, fat, and sugar. 100%. And so if you don't control for the, the, how much people are eating, you're going to essentially find people that eat a lot of salt, a lot of fat, and a lot of sugar are going to have all these problems, but it's mainly because they're probably eating foods that make them overeat. Those are the most delicious foods. That's right. And so if you look at the consumption of ultra processed foods and it's- uh, how, Which are engineered to be the best at all those things. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and how how much of uh, our diets are made up of ultra processed foods. If you line those charts up, you'll see obesity matches it quite nicely. So it's not the sugars, the fats- and the salt, it's the fact that more of our diet now, I think something like 65 to 70% of the average person's diet in America is ultra processed. You're right. Seven, north of 70%. Yeah. And, and the processed. data is very clear. Yeah. They have great studies. I mean, they have crossover studies. We put people in like controlled. Like, how yeah. often do we have controlled diet studies, right? 500 calories a day in over yep. On average. Yeah. And without people counting or anything, just that just makes them want to eat more. Yeah. So when the reason why those things are connected to all these poor outcomes is because it's they're just eating more food. Yeah. That's really the main thing. Now we have to be careful not to be arrogant or classist about these recommendations because not everybody can afford sure. the whole foods or has the time or resources or the cooking capabilities to, to make these healthy meals uh, or healthier meals or lower calorie meals. Um, we see that in lower socioeconomic neighborhoods that are, uh, you know, just covered with fast food places uh, as a matter of convenience and cost uh, and certainly taste. That uh, is, is a bigger issue. And so I've since started backing away from general recommendations about the obesity epidemic mm -hmm. because it, it isn't it, it isn't just about the food it's about the socioeconomic conditions uh, that are involved as well and I have once said that I didn't think government involvement was uh, was a good path because people should have the, you know the opportunity to make those choices for themselves and some people like a snack here or there and it doesn't adversely affect their health and the whole 80 20 scheme sure. of things with the flexible dieting uh, but in fact, if you, it appears that if you want to make any significant inroads uh, on the population as a whole, uh, it probably will take some sort of intervention to prevent folks from having. I'm not a fan of that argument, and I hate it. I'm not. A fan I really of that. do. I'm not a fan. I, of that I just argument. don't know a more effective solution. Yeah, but it's just. I don't it, think the government. It, I, I, fixes I hear anything. where you're coming from, and I know. I know that you've probably been attacked many times for not, you know saying it that way to be more politically correct but i just think that's such well a, i just the government i think it's a bullshit a bullshit excuse do i think that there's some people absolutely and my, my heart breaks for that 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 but we can we can find a way to marginalize almost yeah and ever, you, ever, you, everything I mean, Adam, you grew like. up that way yeah so and that and uh, that wasn't the, the reason right like the, if anything it's actually the the lack of education and understanding i hear you to me and that's what brown university said with respect to the samoans and they sent actually sent people in to educate them about their mm -hmm. dietary choices yes uh and i and i don't know if we are doing them a service by by giving them that out that oh because you're you're lower middle class or you're poor and so you get the excuse to eat these processed foods well, and this bad it, shit because you don't you don't have access well, to it. I mean, we got it. We had uh, what's her name, Melissa? What's Melissa? Yeah. And I remember we didn't say we didn't say anything about that when she said that on the show. And I'm just like, man, this is that that woke message that's coming right now that we we always got to be so careful about how no, we are not helping people by not educating them and not explaining to them by letting them be take the victim role out 
Are, well, are you think we're helping? Well, do you think we're helping? I don't. I don't. And I'll, I'll I don't. You, I, I'll tell you what. It, it's. Uh, I think it's education mainly because you can be very inexpensive with foods that have high shelf lives, like rice. Yeah, beans, beans, potatoes, uh, potatoes, uh, fruits and vegetables. You can find buy frozen vegetables, which have they last a long time, very easy to prepare. I think now availability, but that's a, a consumer driven thing, right? So what the consumers buy is what you tend to get more of. I think it has a lot to do with education. I mean, I, I mean, listen, we 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 lived on food stamps. We got we had churches that gave us food, and when I looked looked at the stuff, if you actually broke down, if you did it mathematically, the dollars. That I mean, we had plenty of Coke and sodas and ice creams and yeah. that what we would get. And you did the math on all that. And then you went and you bought all those foods and, and you ate that. We won, we wouldn't starve. And two, we, we would be much healthier and you could make it happen. Yeah. So I, I, just, I just hate that. And I know why you're doing it and you're saying it. And I totally understand. Now you know why I don't talk about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the obesity <laughs> epidemic. Oh boy, it fucking is, annoys. Yeah, it annoys the shit out of me. We had a guest on our show not that long ago. We didn't say nothing about it when it came up. And I, I'm just not going to let it slide. Yeah. And because also, I, think, I, I don't think we're, if you really care, if you really care, which I want to believe everybody in this room really does I care about trying to solve that issue, the answer is not, uh, you know, being concerned about marginalizing those people or, you know, not talking about the victim, like giving, we already have a problem with victimhood in this country. Yeah. Yeah. So well, that's not solving it. Rant, I did say this, and I said that it, 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 we all want to play pin the tail on the donkey and find an enemy to blame for yeah. this. And I right. said the enemy is also the victim. You're at war with yourself. The source of the problem is also the only solution. And I think that kind of navigates us to where, hey, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why, but ultimately you're the only person that's going to be able to make the change. And I don't think these people are, are not knowledgeable about uh, the fact that they're overeating and, and undermoving. No. Uh, I don't think it's that they don't know that when we talk about education. Yeah. It's just maybe they just don't have these strategies uh, potentially in place or they're just exposed to a greater degree. And again, have all those preconditions of, you know, visceral adiposity and obesity and the hunger signaling yeah. and all the other stuff. So they're more driven uh, to be hungry as we have felt. In well, well, I'll diets. take it. I'll even take it a step further. OK, um, you have subsidies that make certain foods less expensive and when in reality they shouldn't be. You can buy sodas sometimes cheaper than you can buy water because the corn syrup is subsidized through taxpayers. So now I'm going to go buy a Coke and it's a you know two liter Coke is cheaper than buying water. So let's just drink some Coke with our with our meal. So that's one big problem. And then the education that a lot of people do get comes through government. And this is why I hate government involvement. You, had you followed any of the government's guidelines for diet, you'd be very unhealthy. Even till this day, um, they're, some of their guidelines and they're so far behind. It's uh, it's incredible. I mean, their exercise guidelines are far behind. I, we finally have studies showing that uh, strength is an important metric to measure for longevity. You know how long it's taken them I know. to even admit that strength training or strength is important? Yeah. It's been just now we're starting to see that. Yeah. I mean, not just important, it's the primary driver. And I would even suggest, and, and Pat Davidson uh, mentioned this at his seminar, uh, Dr. Pat Davidson, in, I went down to Florida and attended his seminar. We were talking about you know VO2 max and cardiovascular fitness, but that's dependent upon lean mass. Yeah. That, that's what utilizes the oxygen. So you you can have you know people elderly people with sarcopenia uh, with poor uh, uh, cardiovascular fitness, primarily as a result of the fact that they have muscle wasting. Oh yeah, and so that would kind of I would I would suggest that the you know the muscle uh, building and the strength is the primary driver muscle mass for things like overcoming uh, uh, serious illness or injury. And then strength, of course, has been shown to be uh, kind of the, the leading indicator of, of all-cause mortality, which I use this as an opportunity every time I can to, to you know, I love Mark Bell and I just like yeah. to, to dig at him every chance. I get. <laughs> but, and, and I say two things. I say one, that, that I've lived by Mark's um, philosophy all my life. You know, strength is never weakness. Weakness is never a strength. Anything that made me weaker, I was very quick to take that out of my program. Sure. And I have a list of things that make you weak. I talked about metformin and, and uh, 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 antibiotics and uh, even icing um, and things like antiestrogens and had a whole list of things that I don't want my clients doing because I think it makes you weaker. Mm. Uh, these are for strength. Strength athletes. Right. I'm not going to talk about metformin in terms of its potential benefits for people of type 2 diabetics, but I'm just saying, generally speaking, it compromises metabolic function and yeah. it impedes uh, the anabolic response from training, uh, both cardiovascularly and uh, muscularly. So 
Uh, that's why I mentioned it, but I don't want to get too far down the, the road on that. But, um, you know, Mark has always said that weakness is never a strength. And I use that as kind of a, a measurement. And as you know, and as you just said, that, that we use grip strength as a proxy to measure, uh, you know, someone's strength in comparison to other people in the group and then look at the mortality rates. And we see that those with the best grip strength uh, have the longest lifespans uh, and health spans mm -hmm. associated with that. And of course, then everybody ran out and started doing dead hangs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they missed the boat, didn't they? Yeah, they missed the point. But uh, again, just a proxy. You could have done a leg extension or a calf press or a bicep curl. It, it, you know, but whatever measurement it was, everybody would run out and do that thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's overall strength. And then, of course, you know, my, you know, if I wanted to optimize that, I would get them to do the most uh, beneficial strengthening exercises, which would almost always incorporate the largest muscle groups, you know, legs and back in mm. particular. How do you feel about, um, it, cause years ago when we first started the podcast, I would talk about how I thought that creatine would be become, cause it was, it's always been popular. It's been popular for a long time in strength, uh, training and bodybuilding. But I talked about how I thought it was going to be the next wellness supplement. And I think they're going to recommend it to older people and the kids. Well, and now with the cognitive benefits, it is. They almost want to put it in the water. You're, yeah. you're, see, you're seeing all these different things. Yeah. Do you think it's going to become this like this supplement now that we just give to most people? Yeah, I certainly recommend it across the board. Men and women both who are trying to strength train. And there's just mm -hmm. no reason not to. Obviously, I have a higher red meat intake. And so I, I, I'm, I kind of don't respond as well. Plus, performance-enhancing drugs is a whole different world, and, and so you've got yeah. to kind of take it out of that realm. And, you know, creatine offers a, a, a measurable benefit for natural athletes, and uh, there's certainly no reason not to. It's one of the most studied and most, um, I think, beneficial supplements, as supplements go. Uh, that would be the one I would suggest. I don't even necessarily consider protein powder a supplement. You know, it's food, food in a can. Yeah. That's all it is. Just convenient and tastes good. Uh, but as supplements go, you know, if you're going to look at creatine and beta alanine and, and you know, those kinds of, of supplements, creatine is probably the one that works for most people pretty consistently. It's assuming some people have to be a little cautious about how much they consume in any one uh, bolus because it can cause some gastrointestinal Yeah. Uh, effects. Now, going back to the to, to processed food consumption, we're, we're seeing now, and this is the first time in my career that I've seen uh, diets become politicized. Diets have always, yeah, it's always been kind of an issue where it's you a know, religion, yeah, right. right. But yeah. I, I'm, we're starting to see it now become politicized, where people are now told you shouldn't eat meat because it's bad for the environment. Uh, you shouldn't eat meat because it's also bad for your health. And we're, we're going to shame or fear people into avoiding meat, which in my opinion is just going to drive them to eat more processed foods. Because if you look at, like we said earlier, yeah. the average American's diet, 70% processed foods, the 30% that's left over is usually meat, milk, and eggs. And you cut that. So how do you feel about that? You know, that I mean, we message? see that in vegan diets too. They, you know, they, they, they're just improperly uh, applied. Same would be true with meat eating meat you know mm -hmm. it's generally uh, all, most of that stuff is confounded by the healthy user bias and the, the dietary pattern overall for people who consume the most meat uh smoke more drink more exercise yeah. less weigh more uh you know and tend to eat bacon double cheeseburgers with soda uh, as a, or hot dogs and a lot of processed meats uh, but if you're looking at a top sirloin steak you know it's uh it's five grams of fat 1.5 grams of saturated fat and it's got a two to one protein to fat ratio so let's just look at it and i don't mean to get too far into the math on it but if if your recommendations are to eat 30 to 35 percent protein as a total as a percentage of total calories and i hate using percentage because some lighter women probably need more protein uh, to reach. As a percentage. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I would just say total grams of protein. 150-pound right. woman, I might want her to have 130 grams of protein. And uh, that might push north to 40% of total calories if she's dieting. So I'm kind of cautious. Um, and so now my recommendation, at least, is that you need a sufficient amount of fats for general health. You know, every membrane and cell membrane in the body is a, a lipid bilayer, and you need move AD and K around. Uh, and I put that number in at about 30%. It's a pretty healthy range. You get under 20%. You probably start to see some compromise in, in hormone function, mm. testosterone in particular. Um, and th so if 30% of your diet is fat as a percentage of total calories, and 30% of those fats is saturated fat, such as in a top sirloin steak or an egg, um, you know, it gets even lower if you're looking at a fat-free Greek yogurt. Uh, dairy doesn't seem to have a, an adverse cardiovascular impact, although we still recommend maybe a 2% or 1% uh, because of that 
milk fat globule membrane that's somewhat protective of, of its effect uh, and any adverse effect on LDLs. So as you can see, I, I'm diluting uh, as we go here, I 30% fat as a percentage of total calories, 30% saturated fat as a percentage of total fats already puts you at 9%. That's below the AHA's recommendation of 10% uh, saturated mm. fat in the diet. And that's just if you ate red meat, a lean red meat as your only protein source. Uh, to, to reach those macros. And I, I've just discussed that when you throw in an egg-egg white blend and you throw in some fat-free Greek yogurt and you throw in a piece of salmon and uh, those kinds of things, obviously, uh, now you're, uh, you're, you're in pretty good space. So again, we're back to dietary pattern yeah. rather than picking out a particular food and trying to demonize that food individually. And, and look, I've, I've, I've been a, uh, uh, what would you say? I, I've, I've been all over the place talking about how I thought seed oils were terrible for five years and different seed oils, of course, um, because I was allergic to them. And I, I said, look, I'm biased. This is in my video on seed oils. They are a poison to me. I, they give me gastric distress, so I don't include them. 70% plus of the seed oils that we consume are in ultra processed foods and we consume over 70% ultra processed foods in our diet. Um, you know, but even that I've had to revise my, uh, you know, my opinion on whether or not that's bad for you. Uh, is it more of a, it depends now? It, it's more of what's the context as a, if you replace saturated fats with it, it seems to have a, a health benefit. Um, but that would be such like butter, palm oil, coconut oil, uh, the things that are super, super high in saturated fats, assuming they get you north of, 10, 12%, you know, certainly up to 18% saturated fat as a percentage of total calories. Once you get north of that, you're going to start to see LDL uh, if you're susceptible to that. Mm -hmm. And only a percentage of the population has uh, difficulty with LDL clearance. Um, but if you can keep the sat total saturated fat down, uh, you know, obviously I don't include them because I'm allergic to them, which doesn't give me the right to, like if somebody's allergic to, to dairy, they can't say that no, not everybody should have dairy. Same with thing would be true of eggs uh, or shellfish or peanuts. Uh, you know, I always made that distinction that it's individualistic and dose dependent. Um, so uh, I've had to be cautious about how, and in my book, I updated from, you know, mm. where I originally came out five years ago. Uh, you know, and that was, that was largely from, uh, you know, Weston A. Price's recommendation and Chris Masterjohn. And uh, I couldn't get any of them to defend their position. Really? Uh, yeah. I repeatedly reached out to them. I couldn't get them to defend their position. The one person who defended the position was um, Tucker Goodrich. Uh, actually went on Mark Bell's show. Mark asked me, this is funny, and, and uh, you know, Alan Flanagan uh, from Alinea Nutrition is uh, uh, just in the last couple of years has really kind of put himself into a, a leadership position where, you know, he's, he's such a, uh, a bright, uh, brilliant guy in terms of uh, just his knowledge about nutrition. He has a PhD in, in nutrition. Um, but he's the one who came out with the article and he's kind of the thought leader. Now I see everybody else. I follow everybody's accounts on social media. You know, I've, I've you name them. I'm following them. I'm mm -hmm. subscribing to their, uh, I'm reading, I'm watching, you know, I'm, I just, I sit over here quietly <laughs> as you, as you've seen, uh, today in my reference of, of all these folks and kind of their, their evolution, including mine. And they've all evolved, you know, the folks from Barbara medicine commonly recognize things that they used to think that they've changed their opinion on. Uh, Lane Norton's the same way, you know, he's, he used to promote saturated fat as, as being healthy and, and had, and demonstrated and put forth some research on that effect. The guys from examine.com as recently as last year, uh, they have 14 PhDs over there. You know, I'm just a meat neck power lifter. Uh, and they were promoting that saturated fat was not uh, deleterious to cardiovascular disease. Well, the dose makes the poison with that one. Right? The dose makes the poison. Yeah. And they've since updated that to recognize that, you know. And so I, I don't feel too bad if I'm. Uh, if I, if it took me a, a little longer than most on, on some of these topics, but, um, uh, <clears throat> Tucker Goodrich went on to Mark Bell's show and, and had a debate with, uh, Alan Flanagan about this very topic. And, uh, uh, he was the only one, you know, to his credit, although I think Alan Flanagan's, uh, research and the evidence as a whole, uh, supports that position that, uh, that, uh, canola oil can in, in, in replacing saturated fats. Uh, provide a, an improved uh, LDL and then therefore 
uh, cardiovascular disease outcome. You know, I've but, seen studies, though, that show that although that may happen, uh, all-cause mortality actually gets a little worse in some of those studies. Are you familiar with those? Yeah. Are those, uh, like, iffy or? They are very iffy. I think one was the, was it the, Mich was it Michigan and one was in Australia? Yeah. Uh, Alan addressed those, and I could pull them up here. I've got all the information, but um, uh, <clears throat> they were very iffy. Mm -hmm. uh, they were the, I think that uh, there was trans fats involved in that study. Right. It was one of the problems. Um, which we know are pretty much which we know are, any dose. Not yeah, good. that was that was a huge problem. Uh, I think that was called the Minnesota coronary trial. I yeah, think was one. Yeah, and, I believe so. Yeah, um, I've since moved on from that topic. I, like I said, I reached out to all the people who had who had most fervently opposed, uh, and they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't uh, challenge uh, that. So uh, I've you, since moved on. You know, Stan, wouldn't you say one of the challenges with studies on uh, nutrition is that it's it's we have very little or very few, I should say, long-term controlled dietary. They're just so expensive. There's no funding. So a lot of this is like observational for the most part. Um, and when you look at observational studies, there's like, I mean, there's cultures that eat diets that looks radically different from other cultures. And you see health, the, the health is very similar, um, which points back to what you said in the beginning, which is like 95% of the benefits come from eating a reduced calorie loss diet. Itself and exercise. I yeah. Mean, we see this even in like I hate talking about the blue zones because it's it's there's so much confounding there as That's well. That's true. It's so cherry picked, uh, and a lot of those zones, the uh, birth certificate information is hard to validate. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Mm. Uh, so some of those guys aren't a hundred; they're eighty. You know why, by the way? Because in some of these countries, they would lie on the birth certificate so they could get pensions from their and money from the hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Yeah, there so is they a, acted older or they uh, pretended to be older. Oh, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, and I'm I'm happy to provide a resource and reference to that uh, to that review as well. Um, but I guess the point of that whole conversation uh, is is that yes, a they're they're very cherry picked, but b you look at. Um, uh, who are the groups in California, Loma Linda? Uh, oh, the Seventh-day yeah. Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists, but right up the street, you've got the Mormons yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> who have equivalent health outcomes with meat in their diet. Right. And somehow they're just magically, you know, not in uh, the Blue Zones. And remember, the Blue Zones is not a study. It's a book, right? Uh, you know, that was, that was uh, I think, highly biased and, and cherry-picked. Um, <clears throat> But the point being is, is the dietary pattern of the Mormons or the lifestyle pattern of the Mormons is oh, more good. important. So we yeah. when I talk about dietary patterns as opposed to individual foods, and I talked about the healthy user bias, the, the Mormons don't smoke, they don't drink, they exercise regularly, they maintain a, uh, you know, a lower BMI and, mm -hmm. and waist measurement, they uh, uh, generally exercise more, they uh, have better social uh, environments. So all of those things seem to you know, take a priority over whether or not you're having um, some red meat. I will say this though. I will say that sufficient fiber does seem to show a decrease in cancer risk. Uh, and Lane has referred to a number of, uh, some research suggests if you get adequate fiber with your meat intake, and again, as a portion of a, of a dietary pattern, that it, it's, it's fine. The only reason I keep harping on it is because specifically with women, I find, and I was just this summer, I was up in, mm. in Arizona and I was working with a, a high school softball team. And a couple of parents told me that the girls had had a decline in performance recently. And that's very common. I was working with the University of Oregon track team back in the early 90s. And one of the things that we saw most was shin splints. And we mm. saw that with the, the Nike coach. Uh, it was highly popular, popularized or that uh, one, a couple of his athletes had significant health issues. Uh, comes from the female triad. And that's, uh, you know, a, a, a calorie restriction resulting in anemia, amenorrhea, uh, osteopenia. Uh, and so sure enough, that's the first question I asked is she had a blood test and, uh, and they went and got her blood test. Sure enough, she was anemic. And I see that, that women who are in a severe calorie restriction, uh, who trend towards carbs and, and insufficient protein, and they avoid dairy and red meat, they have a higher incidence of those problems. And so that's kind of why I, I keep hounding on uh, having red meat in the diet, not exclusively, but uh, but certainly don't exclude it, don't demonize it or dairy for the calcium benefits. Uh, and so within probably a week or 10 days, she was feeling amazing. We just, uh, the resolution for low iron would be to use a heme iron source, a non-heme iron source with vitamin C and avoid calcium in that meal. So you, did, you, did, you had her eat meat. So we designed a diet for her that included uh, steak, 
spinach and peppers or oranges. For so that C. was heme, non-heme, vitamin C. And we avoided dairy in that specific meal because it can inhibit absorption mm. in that meal. And then her next meal would say be eggs with yogurt. <clears throat> and so two times a day, she would have the, the high iron. And within, I mean, it was probably a week. She's That's phenomenal. What was she, did, was she following a particular diet before that? No, that's the problem. A lot of high school athletes, they, they, they she just try, she was just trying to stay lean. So she was eating low calorie. They avoid the yeah. trigger foods that they see that, you know, I'm not going to eat red meat. I'm not going to eat dairy. I'm not going to eat fruit. Mm -hmm. And then they end up just on bagels, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and occasional, you know, egg white or, or something like that. So insufficient protein is probably the primary driver, chronic calorie restriction. Uh, and then those other items, red meat and the dairy. Do you, do you, do you, see, do you think a big problem um, with just health and, and wellness is that people, they just want that silver bullet answer. They just yeah. want like, mm -hmm. just tell me like the best exercise or just tell me the yeah. best food. Yeah. And, and yeah. really the data is becoming so clear that there is no yeah. – specific i mean unless you're talking to a specific individual and you're breaking that them down like you said with this young lady yeah. with her there were specific foods but it's impossible well we already said it the best exercise is the one you'll do the best exercise or the best diet is the one you'll follow i mean and those are truthful but not useful you mm. know the the individual has to be provided that's why i say my clients say stan just tell me exactly what to eat and i base that on all the things that we've discussed this far uh, and then try and cater that to their personal preferences so that they can comply with it. Uh, more whole foods, more protein, uh, you know, better sleep. That's why the vertical diet isn't just diet. It's diet, sleep, exercise. I, I don't, I don't think this. humans are, are partial to, I don't, are, I don't think that it's uh, just exercise. I think it's everything. Everything. I think yeah, we that, want the silver. I, think we, yeah. Yeah, I hate the dichotomy. Again, I hate that we have to, yeah, it's what's like, better than the other. And, but I mean, that's how, that's how the human brain works, right? That it, we want, we want to, we first want to use the, the quick monkey brain. Just give me the direction. <laughs> tell me the, the three things really fast. It, it's yeah. a switch over to the second phase, right? Of the brain. You have to process, you have to think you have to sit down you have to slow like nobody wants to do yeah. that you so know, yeah. I, I think it's less about exercise it's more about human behavior 100 and the it's way about, we process all information it's about compliance it's about creating uh, well if it's a diet then what's the least restrictive to you how are you the least hungry that's why people say well uh, i started doing intermittent fasting and it worked and and, and they're again they're adamant about it mm -hmm. they're religious about it it worked for you because you didn't feel you weren't hungry on it. Same thing with keto, you know, keto works for me. And that's great. I think that's fine for those reasons. You mentioned a little earlier, what things do I watch out for? Yeah. And those are some of the things I'm cautious of is that people get themselves into an over-restrictive environment that's not necessarily sustainable long-term. I do see some issues with, uh, with keto diets and again, they can work. I think it's a good initial intervention for somebody with type two diabetes in particular, so long as they can get a calorie deficit, lose weight, um, because they don't obviously assimilate carbohydrates sufficiently. But I get about four to six weeks in on most keto diets. And it's not like I haven't done keto diets multiple times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I worked with Dave Palumbo 10 years oh, ago. He's keto so, king, yeah. yeah, he's the keto king. Uh, I've done keto many times throughout my career and preparing for a show. I always got weaker. I always got more tired. Uh, I always lost more muscle. And that's kind of what I see. Now we can try and mitigate some of that, obviously with the training and the, the protein intake and mm -hmm. sufficient electrolytes. That's kind of the first thing that happens with the water loss from the carbohydrate depletions that we see, you know, they lose five, six, seven pounds of water and then they lose all the sodium associated with that water and then they start to get tired as a result. Mm -hmm. So we can mitigate some of that. And then I have to also, uh, you know, I like to get the blood test. Let's see your LDLs. You want to go keto, cautious, you know, what the fatty, uh, how we, what, what kind of fats that are in there, you know, maybe more salmons, more avocado, more nuts, more, you know, in, in a case like that, as opposed to these fat bombs and the butter in your coffee because, yeah. uh, you know, the LDL is a consideration. Yeah. Do you, so I want to change gears a little bit and move into exercise. Uh, because I've, I'm wanting to ask you this because you're a smart guy. You've been doing this for a long time. So you have a lot of experience and I would say wisdom. Um, and so you've been doing this long enough to now see some of these trends. I'm now reading mainstream articles that are saying things like um, strength training, maybe the key to longevity. Uh, we talked earlier about the strength metric, right? Squeezing uh, a grip test is actually, a, in terms of single metrics, is one of the best predictors of all cause mortality. We're seeing now that they're advocating for strength training to fight uh, dementia, uh, to manage uh, type 2 diabetes. Is strength training starting to have its 
it's time. Is is the time started finally here where we're going to finally start start talking about this uh, to the average person? Yeah, and I think I, we were kind of touching on that a moment ago before I got sidetracked. Uh, is that that the longevity people? Uh, Dr. Peter T is is one is kind of one of the, the leaders in the industry that I think has come a long way in terms of of the the caliber of people that he's he's been bringing to his show. Uh, obviously, you know, Lane Norton most recently, um, and uh, and that's what the consensus seems to be now amongst the academic professionals. Obviously, you know, the the meat neck nerds. We we've always hoped that that would be the case. <laughs> we want validation for you know this this obsession that we've had all our lives. And I'm not suggesting everybody should be a competitive powerlifter or bodybuilder, but um, you know they should certainly lift. And and here's the important distinction. I was just uh, talking to. Um, uh, Michael Hearn last week or the week before about this, we were talking about cardio and strength training. And I'm not sure if, if I, uh, it was just kind of the first time this, this topic had really come up and I'm not sure if I had, had, had very, uh, very well, uh, I think, uh, articulated the position. But what we do see is it's, it's the health benefits, the, the uh, lifespan and health span benefits are dependent upon the results more than the activity. And by that, I mean that, that people who just exercise more uh, don't realize the same longevity benefits as those who have better metrics of having exercise, such as VO2 max and, like you said, strength and lean mass. So it's not just working out. It's uh, are you getting results? 100%. Are you adapting? Are you your building, body building? Are you building muscle? 100%. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And, and that's important. And then look, again, what's the best exercise? The one you'll do, you know, at some point, if you're training a client and they're not getting stronger or gaining lean muscle mass or improving their VO2 max, then... Uh, Again, exercise is great, but they're not getting all the benefits that they may be intending to get just from move, doing the, the work itself. You want it, That should be measurable and progressible. Agree. And mm -hmm. I, in fact, I'll, I'll take it even a step further. If you're exercising a lot and you're not noticing improvements in your physical performance, muscle, maybe fat loss, blood lipids, in, in fact, you may actually be causing detrimental effects because it's now mm -hmm. just a stress. Because the exercise is the stressor that causes the adaptation. It's the adaptation you get the benefits from, not the, not the stressor itself. The stressor by itself is just a stressor. And we know that as coaches of athletes. Yes. The overtraining is a big issue, right? 100%. Yeah. Fatigue management. Like you said, especially athletes who aren't bodybuilders or powerlifters. The last thing you want to do is influence or impact, adversely impact their ability to perform whatever sport or whatever practice for that sport that they have to engage in. Uh, I worked with John Jones recently, uh, and that was one of the biggest things we did. It was funny because we would do, um, you what know, what was that like, by the way, working with him? Oh, it was great. He's he's a phenomenal athlete. He's got really good like strength and muscle building genes, which mm -hmm. I didn't even realize because he always looks kind of long and lanky. It's incredible. Yeah, the hard part was, you know, we just got him up over two hundred fifty pounds was the goal, two hundred fifty five pounds. Holy cow! Right I didn't know that. The hard part with him was the eating, uh, and and we can. Uh, just briefly, I'll say that, that John kind of likes to eat what he wants to eat when he wants to eat, which like a lot of my clients. <laughs> and so, you know, I would send him meals, but he, you know, he wouldn't necessarily enjoy them consistently um, and, and getting him just to eat breakfast. So those were some of the hard challenges with John. Um, and so that's the first question I asked, what do you like to eat? Where do you like to eat? So we started going to the restaurants that he liked to eat at. And I've said this many times before that sometimes clients who don't have an opportunity to make their food uh, and have to eat out, I'll just Google the restaurant menu and, and pick a few things on there that I think are optimal. I do mm. this with high school kids. I did this for the softball team because they are a traveling team. And I said, look, you can go to any of these different places, whether it's Carl's Jr. or McDonald's, and, you know, because that's what you're going to do anyhow. Let's make the optimal choice. And for me, that's just I just look for a two-to-one protein-to-fat ratio. Generally, that's a chicken source because most of the meats at those places are 75-25 beef. Mm. And you have a really hard time meeting those those requirements, but a Subway sandwich, you get a meatball sandwich is not as much protein and a lot of fat, but if you get the steak or the grilled chicken breast, you know, throw a little bit of cheese on there. Double uh, meat. It, it, double yeah. meat. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. And that's kind of how I, I do that. But aside from that, I can remember we posted a video of John doing some, uh, it was like pin squats or chain squats where you go down and you, you know, you kind of, you let the, the eccentric kind of crash into the weights and you just do the concentric portion right. and you don't necessarily do a full range of motion with a six foot five 
guy with you know sure, wingspan right. like him uh, because that is just going to create a lot more damage. And and in terms of sports performance, I only need you know that's right. Uh, I, I don't need the full range of motion for sports performance because I've always said that if 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 he's at full range of motion, he's losing the fight. That's right. right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just want him to be explosive. So I posted that, and of course that went on to ESPN Fight News or whatever else on Instagram, and all the fucking internet <laughs> experts, yeah. you know, are in there like, yeah. do a full squad, and yeah. you know, he's going to hurt himself, and it's like. So we design programs uh, for athletes that might not look like a bodybuilder's program uh, or a powerlifter's program because we're trying to eliminate a lot of the fatigue and the eccentric hmm. loading. Eccentric. Since, since you brought up John Jones, I, I want I want to hear your prediction because right away when you said the, the challenges um, with the diet and adherence and stuff like that, um, I actually have found this very common with many athletes, especially training high high level athletes, because uh, they have been able to uh, burn uh, up whatever they consume, and they are great at their sport, and yeah. so they don't want to disrupt that. So when you see this, and especially when you get a chance to coach them, and you're trying to get them to adhere, and you see them struggle, struggle. If you had to predict uh, the things that John Jones is going to be challenged with in 20, 25 years when he's no longer fighting, playing his sports, and moving and burning as many calories, what what would you predict and see would happen? Well, I think the same thing. Everybody has to happen. You burn fewer calories and you eat more is is what happens. People think their mes- metabolic rate slows, but we, we see now from the research between age 20 and probably 60, uh, we don't see a significant decline no. in metabolic rate. We see people move less and they eat more. And that's, uh, I think, you know, and that's the folly of a lot of athletes, particularly football players. You see them post football, man, they just, yeah. they're used to eating a lot of food because they were doing daily doubles for, oh, yeah. you know, four hours a day of training. I, I, I think that that's a lot of the reason why their, their lifespan is so low is, is because I know like we want to connect it, uh, to the hard hitting and the stress in the body, which yeah. I'm sure that's not helping the case whatsoever. No, but I would make the case that a lot of it is they they have had they have built these eating behaviors around you know a, a body that is burning six seven thousand calories True. every day day. But day. now we got to say, look, people's metabolisms are different. We kind of had this conversation a little bit about some people who have a harder time losing weight than others. Right. We see in overfeeding studies, uh, you know, generally speaking, people will gain weight. But if you look at the inter-individual responses to overfeeding studies, you'll see that one person might gain 20 pounds. One person might lose four. Yeah. And they both had an equivalent uh, calorie surplus throughout that study. I'm that guy. I, I'll lose weight. I have to do everything I can to maintain my weight. Mm. And so if you ask me where I'm going to be in 20 years, I'm going to be lighter. John's kind of the same I'm, way. I'm the same way as you are. Yeah. Like, like if, I, if I don't stay on top of my yeah, protein intake, especially and calories, <laughs> I'll lose weight on the scale. And it yeah. feels and looks like muscle. It I looks- went down to, to, to Dallas or Wichita Falls to Mark Ripito's over the weekend to do a seminar. He oh, had right. a gathering of all of his starting strength people. He's doing phenomenal. I mean, he's got like 30 gyms open nationwide. Wow. Now, wow. The starting strength group. And I, I, I love Mark and, and their method. Uh, I think it's fantastic. They're doing a great job for the very kind of people that we're talking about just to increase strength. And that's, that's mm. been his foundation. And I know he's gruff and, you know, but uh, that's, that's his goal. He just wants people to get stronger five pounds a week, you know, and he's, he's been clear about that for 20 years. Mm. But uh, I left on a Friday afternoon. I came back on a Sunday morning and I took all my meals with me and I lost four pounds <laughs> just, from, <laughs> just from the travel. And I know a lot of people will hate on that because like my wife's Samoan, she uh, looks grass is always greener on the other weight. side. That's what I tell them. But then for my sport, you know, trying to gain yeah. weight, that was, and that's kind of one of the challenges I deal with, with say like a Hofthor Bjornsson or uh, a, uh, a uh, 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 Lane Johnson from the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah. It's harder to eat enough to maintain that mass and that workload and that, uh, you know, I think Lane was 312 pounds and he needed to be 330. When I started working with him, he had a registered dietitian do a diet for him. And this is not an indictment on registered dietitians. My co-author for The Vertical Diet is uh, Dr. Damon McCune, who's a PhD RDN, was director of dietetics for UNLV. Uh, that dietitian recommended uh, chicken breast and quinoa, like five cups of quinoa a day. <laughs> and uh, I mean, has anybody ever eaten five cups of quinoa oh, a day? God. And so, and, and, and some, that kind of gets me off into this thought that, I mean, if you haven't done it, why are you prescribing it for somebody? You know, uh, if you haven't eaten 6,000 calories a day uh, of the foods that you're recommending for this individual, or at least tried, you know, to eat in a surplus, 
then you know be cautious about your confidence in that in that prescription because uh, Lane couldn't eat it and he was having all kinds of problems obviously so you know that was one of the things I was able to get him up to 330 pounds just using obviously easier to digest foods what you have to is a huge mm-hmm. consideration when you're eating that much food is can yeah. you digest it well 100 yeah. percent yeah and that's why you know people are like oh, white rice it's like Nobody in a calorie deficit on the vertical diet eats white rice because you're utilizing fruits and vegetables and high potassium right. foods as the foundation. It's only the people who have a significant workload or lots of lean body mass who need 4,000 plus calories and can't consume a ton of pasta and oats or bread in that quantity because it, it bloats them and makes it hard for them to consume all the food. Mm-hmm. So the same thing with Brian Shaw and I worked with him. Like a week into the diet, he's like, Stan, I'm, I'm hungry. I haven't been hungry in years. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, and that's because we used, you know, the Monster Bash, more easy, to, you know, mm-hmm. mechanically speaking, foods you could shovel down and, you know, in greater quantities faster, it would digest quicker, you'd be hungry again sooner, and then you could eat again. So, th- so this is, it's very similar to what we talked about earlier with weight loss. When you're, when you're looking at weight loss, your considerations are satiety. Is it going to be something sustainable? It's the same thing with same thing. people trying to gain is can we uh, manage satiety? It's just yeah. in the opposite direction, right? Mm-hmm. Can we give you foods that don't stuff you and keep you so full because you got to yeah. eat you know, 5,000 calories? And for those people, and I know this is a small percentage. It's so funny when I do these seminars, I've got a, a broad uh, spectrum of people, you know, weight loss, weight gain, people with medical conditions, et cetera. Uh, and I, I start talking about weight gain. And I know I've turned off about 90% of and, and most of the women in the room are, you know, they, they see me work with a Brian Shaw and, and, and a, and a Hofthor Bjornsson and they're like, they don't want to be there. You know? <laughs> and so I, I got to start throwing up the, the Nadia Wyatt's, you know, at 114 pounds or the, um, I've got a girl, uh, uh, BJ that, uh, uh, it competes at like 114, eats 2,600 calories a day. Wow. Yeah. She's a machine, but when I met her three years ago, she was on 1,200 calories. Yeah. Day. You know, that was a long, slow process of, of getting her body, uh, getting her to build muscle and, and improve her metabolism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Stan, how, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Be 55 next month. Holy cow. Yeah. So let me ask you this, because you've been doing this for so long. Personally, how has your training changed, or do you have different considerations now 100%. that you're in your mid-50s? What does that 100%. look like? Uh, mostly, obviously, your recovery starts to to take longer from high fatigue movements. So a lot of the workouts you see me done do recently, it just, this is funny because I haven't competed in over 10 years. And so, and, and for a few years after I stopped competing, I, I thought about one more. And so I was going in there and I was doing the heavy squats and the heavy deadlifts more frequently with, with too many north of 90% efforts. Uh, and I was just tired all the time. My shoulders and elbows and knees were still wrecked. And I talked about this on my videos for keys to pain-free knees. And I broke my back. Those are my rants where I spoke about uh, how you resolve those issues. But how I train differently now is, is I do fewer of those top end sets. And I try and do lower fatigue movements. Uh, and I do a lot more volume as kind of Louis Simmons thing. And probably what really got me through my career as both bodybuilding and powerlifting is that uh, the bodybuilding, I did a ton more volume, uh, more sets, more reps, shorter rest periods. And so uh, my cardiovascular fitness was really good. And it kind of carried me through those, those powerlifting preps um, and was able to maintain my health uh, to, the, to the best of my abilities. I gained and lost the weight. That's why I periodize my big athlete's weight. And the first thing I did with Hofthor Berenson was take him from 440 down to in the 390s mm. to resolve some fatty liver and insulin resistance that we saw in the blood test. Uh, so I periodize their weight with their competitions throughout the year. I don't let them stay heavy while they're not competing heavy. Uh, mass moves mass, so I do get them back up in weight. But I'm kind of the same way. I, I just now I, I try and minimize fatigue. So my training now, uh, CT Fletcher reached out to me last month and he said, "Hey, are you still deadlifting?" And I wasn't really, and certainly not heavy. You know, I, like 600 pounds was a heavy deadlift for me a month or two ago. Oh, that's so that's so light. Three months ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for, I mean, for him it is right. I know. It's, I know. It, it's embarrassing for me to talk about nowadays. I talk about you know I, I'm a member of the AARP now because I'm so old. <laughs> so I talk about my AARP PRs. <laughs> you know, this is my post retirement PRs, my PR PRs. Uh, and he said, Hey, would you come down and deadlift at my meet in January? And you know, it's CT Fletcher. You don't say no to CT. Yeah, you know, yeah. He's a legend. And so I said, sure, I'll come down. And then I hung up the phone and I realized, shit, 
I can't deadlift anything. I'm going to go embarrass myself down there. So I wanted to start deadlifting heavy. So I couldn't just go deadlift heavy. So I, I used accessories. And, and the two that I, I've been doing a lot now, you see me do recently in the last month or two, uh, is box squats. That tends to, to give you less fatigue. Plus, it, it, it eliminates that, that, that portion of the lift, yeah. as I mentioned with John Jones, where you're reversing the weight that eliminates some of the eccentric at that muscle length that's going to give you a lot of, uh, of muscle soreness. And so, uh, plus it also dissipates that stretch reflex, which is, uh, you know, what a, a deadlift is. You, you don't have, have to, that, right? You don't have it. You've got to create tension there. So I love the box squat for that reason. Uh, plus it's low fatigue. The next day I don't feel crushed. I can do 600 pound box squats and I don't feel crushed, you know, with the, mm -hmm. uh, using the kabuki bar right now. Uh, and then I'll do uh, good mornings as another accessory for deadlifts. Uh, but on to chains, as I mentioned earlier, same thing I did with John, something I did with athletes is, is I, I try to eliminate some of the eccentric load and just do the concentric portion, crash, bring it down. You can see all this on the Instagram. Mm. Uh, I've posted a lot of, and people are like, oh my God, doesn't that hurt? And I'm like, actually it hurts less than doing a true good morning or a true squat, uh, mm. particularly the next day. Uh, but I do need to build, uh, obviously I need to progress those loads over time so I can, that could translate to a deadlift. Um, Such so, a smart strategy. Yeah, I'll work up and just do a couple of top sets uh, of uh, of the box squats or a few top sets of the, and then once a month I'll try and test my deadlift to see if these are are. I, I said it has to be measurable, progressible, but it also has to be transferable. This is something that's very important when you're talking about athletes. If they're not getting faster or jumping higher or matter. throwing further, then uh, you're wasting their time. It's exercise, not training. And so for me, I use the deadlift as a test. So once a month. I try and see, did I get stronger? And you can either move the same weight faster or you can add some more weight and, and, and test that for yourself. There's a, uh, and then I also add a ton of volume to that. I have to keep those 50, 60% uh, loads in and just move a lot. I do the four bikes a day still on the recumbent bike, as I mentioned, for 10 minutes. With so you do 10 minutes, four times a day? 10 minutes, four times a day. Uh, did it this morning at the hotel, uh, walked around, um, and then I, I try and get a lot of volume in. So sometimes I'll split my workouts where I'll come in in the morning, I'll do the box squatting, uh, and then maybe do a, a, a bunch of um, uh, belt squats, um, walking lunges, things like that, just, just to keep moving. Sled drags, I just keep moving. And then come to find out all these many years later, I, I had never met um, uh, uh, Louis Simmons out at, uh, out at uh, uh, Westside until just a couple of years ago. Uh, but Mark Bell's obviously a, a Louis Simmons West Side style training. So I, I utilized those methods with him. Uh, but one of the things I found out through my buddy, Matt Whitmer out at beat training, who, who competed for Louis for over 10 years. And he was a, um, he was a, a, a student of Buddy Morris. He, he, he coached, uh, he did strength and conditioning coaching in, uh, in the NFL for Buddy Morris, who's a, uh, those people who know in the NFL, he's just a legend for strength and conditioning. Um, come to find out that that was behind the scenes. I don't think people appreciate that that was Louis's philosophy, whether or not all of his athletes uh, achieved that, was that they had to have a pretty high level of, of fitness. Uh, they'd do a decent amount of volume outside of their heavy stuff, uh, whether it was the sled drags or just repeating, uh, maybe on 90 second intervals, repeating sets of five at 50, 60% mm. or some band tension. Uh, but it, it, it develops, a, I think, a really good, um, GPP, so they call it general physical preparedness, so that I'm able to do more and recover from it better uh, if I have that foundation. So lo lo lower intensity, but more volume or maybe more frequency? Yeah, fewer 90 plus percent. Yeah. And even with those, I try and deload the highest fatigue portion of the movement, testing once a month, and then lots of volume. If that yeah. summarizes, I'm finding it. the same thing. You know, I'm 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 training most of my body almost every day, but the total volume per workout is less, but the total volume per week is actually quite high. Yeah, and I feel better. And I'll split some of those because I I can't train for an hour and a half straight. I just dig, I dig too deep a hole. I, I say we're not digging ditches, we're building mountains. And so mm. I, I try and get in and out of the gym in less than an hour if I can. Uh, so if you're gonna have a long, you know, if you're gonna do two, you know, an hour and a half of workout, you'll do half and then half. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'll come back at night and do another 30, 35 minutes. Great, great. All right, one last thing. Um, how's how's your business going? How's everything going? With, oh, it's fantastic. With, yeah. Everything's been going good. I'm, I've been blessed. I've had a, a fantastic following. Uh, uh, you know, and I was just watching some more videos today of uh, people who say that the more information they put out there, I think we might have talked about this many, many years ago. Same thing, you've got the same philosophy you had and still have. 
is that we just give people as much content uh, and much information, and it comes back to you tenfold. A very loyal group. I mentioned that my business partner in my meal prep company had passed away recently. He was, uh, he struggled with obesity and alcoholism, mm. uh, and he ultimately had kidney failure and he passed away uh, in his fifties. It was, it was sad, but, um, and so I had to uh, find a new provider and it took about four months. I was completely down. I didn't have any, wasn't able to serve any meals. Oh, we, wow. we had been very successful for over four years. I had a very loyal clientele, um, with a vertical diet meal prep that would uh, order meals for me every week. Uh, and it was fantastic. And I was very grateful. And I had to send them all an email and let them know, hey, we're down and I'm, I'm working hard. I'll try and get back up as soon as I can. Of course, that always takes longer and costs more than you ever anticipate. Uh, but in fact, we're back up as of three weeks ago. And uh, 60% of my clientele has already come back just oh, in three great. weeks. Wow. Yeah. Wow, and I, I'm just so grateful uh, to have that group. It's a, you know, it's folks who I've said before that, that, I've probably, you know, I've been in 14 countries in all 50 states in the last five years doing seminars, over 200 seminars. And I, two summers ago, I did that 60 cities in 60 days tour. Oh, I did geez. a seminar every night and I did uh, all 48 states plus DC. I did 60 seminars in 60 days, drove over 16,000 miles in an RV uh, doing a seminar every night all over the country. I'd mapped out a little uh, path. And I met thousands of people over that trip, as I've met thousands and thousands more uh, throughout the course of my career. Uh, but I've also received probably over 100,000 DMs in the last five years, as you guys get them all the time as well. And I do my best to try and respond to the vast majority of them with uh, you know, a specific answer, maybe a link, a copy paste of an article that's relevant to the topic that they've asked about. And that kind of thing, you know, not hiding that behind a paywall, which I may still do someday, so I should be careful, <laughs> get, out, get out in front of myself here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't have a Patreon or a paywall or anything like that. And uh, I've just put everything I know into my Vertical Diet ebook, and it's now in volume 3.0, and then 4.0 is coming out next month. I've been saying that for a year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it really is, it's just a living document that is, I just compile almost everything everybody asks me. If it's not in my ebook, I add it. And so that's how it continues to expand and grow to now over 225 pages and more than 500 references to peer reviewed articles and videos and researches, just because people ask me those questions and I want to have answers for them. And I'm, uh, I try and provide them, you know, the best information possible and provide them references and resources to where they can get closer to their resolution. Well, Stan, since he brought up the business thing, I do want you to touch on something that I thought was really interesting. I heard you on Bill, you kind of, and you guys just lightly went over this, so I'd like you to go maybe in a little bit deeper. But how has uh, strength training and training in general uh, played a role in making millions of dollars for you? Yeah, I, boy, I've said ever since the I'm I'm pretty OCD, obsessive, compulsive. I, I've always been kind of a routines guy, and that you know, bodybuilding, when I got to college was probably the best thing for me. Uh, you know, I was diagnosed as a kid and they wanted to put me on medication, but I, I was a no go for that. Uh, but when I got into bodybuilding, everything seemed to, to, to work for me because there's so much routine and regimen and consistency and, and consist it. everything is mapped out for your entire day. You're eating every two or three hours, depending on what era you're in. It used to be two. Now it can, now it's three, uh, you know, it, and it's a particular type of meal with this, that, and the other, and your, your training and your, your cardio or whatever it is, uh, you have this schedule and this routine that's, that's so consistent. It, it bode well for me. And there was always some sort of progression involved. You know, you always, whether it was bodybuilding or powerlifting, you were trying to achieve a particular goal. And you would keep repeating those behaviors that worked. And you would, uh, you know, from trial and error or education, you would start to discard those things that didn't work. Same thing came true for business. I said this in a video years ago, that if people would spend the body, any bodybuilder, powerlifter, successful uh, athlete would apply the same level of discipline, consistency, and time management into any income producing venture, they'd be a millionaire in five years. And that's just because of repeating successful behaviors and having such a, a rigid, consistent schedule. I think most people just kind of get uh, I think paired with uh, patience also, right? I think that's something that bodybuilding teaches you. Like you don't get to just overnight look like you. No. It takes, it doesn't take weeks, it doesn't no. take months. It takes years and years of yeah. consistency. And I think we, we have that same kind of attitude a lot of times when we, we say we want to be rich or I want to have the biggest podcast in the world. Or you, you just say a statement like that, um, but you don't, you don't realize all the steps 
that you have take to a take long time. and how long you need to be it consistent at those before and, and you actually start to repost Consistency is, is huge because we see that with Mark Bell. I mean, I, I've told this story before. When I met Mark back in 2009 and I was training with him, he was in a little 800 square foot alcove off the side of the CrossFit box and they were going to raise his rent $400 a month. And he came to me and said, look, I'm going to have to shut the gym down. I said, I can't afford it. Mm. And he was driving this beat up old car with the hubcaps missing and he was driving 30 minutes each way so he could be in a neighborhood he could afford to live in outside of Sacramento. Uh, and he just started putting up content and he just kept doing it. He was relentless about it every single day from, you know, before YouTube was popular and certainly before Instagram or, or TikTok ever existed. Uh, and, and he was just so consistent about it. And look what he's, he's built in the process. Plus he's real. That's another thing. When I first started doing my rhinos rants, I thought, well, what's my character going to be? And I'm not <laughs> C.T. Fletcher, you know, and I'm not Mark Bell. I don't have that WWE thing. I don't have the 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 F-bomb thing. It's just not my thing. And I, I, I'm like, I'm pretty boring. You know, I'm pretty blue collar at heart. I'm, uh, you know, kind of a, a nerd on this stuff. And uh, and I thought, so and I just decided I just I, I just have to be me. And people took to it very well. I didn't have to pretend to be anything else. And, and uh, you know, my Rhino's Rants have been kind of my most successful, successfully viewed uh, content that I've put out there other than the fact that I wore myself out to every podcast. That <laughs> <laughs> calls me. I'm like, sure. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> you guys are like, hey, Stan, can you come by? Right. Yeah, I'll be there. And she said, what, what did she say? It was a month ago. And she said, like, well, they have an availability at the end of, uh, uh, of, end of uh, September. And I'm like, yeah, like they're busy for a month. Like yeah. they're booked out for a month. <laughs> can I come up tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> did she show you our correspondence? No, no. no, no. no. Oh, yes. oh my God. Yeah, yeah, we, don't yeah, we don't do our well. schedules. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah. Oh, good well, stuff. well, good deal, man. Well, hey, you know, uh, sorry to keep soaking up your time here, yeah, but sure one no. thing I want to talk about that, that that it's huge, hugely important for parents and kids alike. I just recently started a, a kids power hour, a vertical kids power hour at the Sin City Iron. I, I recently invested in and in, in part owner of Sin City Iron in Las Vegas, and I I started this kids power hour primarily because I wanted my kids to lift weights, and so I set it up, you know, so that that I'd be there. Mm. Uh, and now we've got 25 kids from ages uh, I said kindergarten to college, uh, and sure enough, a bunch of seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, eleven year olds. There's this one 12 year old kid that's like his dad's like six seven, three eighty, and this kid's already like six foot two sixty. Holy at cow. 12 years old, the kid's huge. Yeah, he's, he's just a monster. Um, but there's also a, a little five-year-old girl that comes in and she'll, uh, I have her pick up a little pink kettlebell and do five reps of, of, the point being is, is that the American Academy of Pediatrics has a position statement that weightlifting for kids is essential. Uh, Brad Schoenfeld recently posted that even as early as five to seven years old. About time. Uh, improves bone mineral density. Obviously, uh, they're not going to build the muscle mass, but they get their neural adaptation and, and hence, therefore, a, a strength adaptation from the training. Uh, he's All of these guys have been crushing the old myth that uh, somehow weightlifting was bad for kids and might stunt their growth. And uh, just the opposite is true. It actually uh, limits injury in other sports. It's least, less injurious than other sports, certainly any contact sport. Um, in fact, the number one injury, 65% of injuries that occur in the gym is simply dropping a weight on yourself. <laughs> so I set all those up ahead of time <laughs> so the kids don't have to touch any weights. But we bring them in and we, we teach them to squat, bench, and deadlift. And we tell them the goal is progression over time. That's great. That's yeah. cool. And I just think the parents should know that, uh, that it's the foundation of any sport, if you want to be, if you want to run faster, jump higher, and throw further, building strength, lifting weights, like every high school and collegiate athlete does, can be started in junior high school or before, uh, and it's perfectly healthy. And again, increasing bone mineral density for girls in particular should be started as early as possible because that. Uh, becomes harder and harder to do as they age. It's interesting you bring that up. I literally yesterday I was actually just looking up this uh, franchise that I'm really interested in right now. It's relatively new. It's called Kids Strong. Heard of it? Have yeah, you heard of it? Yeah. yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I, it's, yep. I, it was. It's fascinating to me, and I and I definitely think that there's there's an opportunity there, yep. uh, not only for a great business, but to to help a ton of people. 
uh, and there's not a lot of people in that space. So it's pretty cool that you're you're moving that direction. But yeah, just literally yesterday, I was like diving yeah. through all their stuff because I was interested in potentially investing in something like that. It's the foundation. Yeah, hundred percent. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that last part. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks yeah. for coming on, Stan. Thanks yeah. for having me, yeah. guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. Always great. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury. That's another thing. You'll see less injury as well.